Welcome to the Poisoner's Cabinet. I'm Sinead. And I'm Nick. And this is your weekly podcast exploring the lives of the great poisoners and poisoning cases from across the centuries and creating curious cocktails inspired by the tales that we tell. And it's episode 33. Yay! Yay! Huzzah and hurrah. How are you, Nick? I'm all right. You're going to die, aren't I'm you? I'm going to die soon. Oh, poor Nick, because you're tired. I've never seen you this tired. <laughs> oh, no, work is mean. <laughs> I came to your house. You were upstairs. I just like left a gin at the stairs. You then poured out two massive glasses of Diet Coke and downed them. <laughs> It'll um, keep me going. Uh, uh, any poisonings this week? I uh, b- b- got probably. Probably. Probably, I just haven't noticed anything. Just out in your tiredness that you've <laughs> just been mixing things. Potentially, I've just been killing all around me and just not even noticed. <laughs> so. I mean, if, 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 if I have, then it's worked well because no one's questioned me on it. No, no one's come to your door. <laughs> no. yeah. We don't even know. Perfect like deniability. Complete obliviousness. <laughs> It won't work if they come to the door and they say, did you poison someone? Probably. Probably could, I could have done. I don't know. Might not have done. Your top hat was found at the scene. My God, it must have been me. Well, you know what, Nick? If you can bear to stay away. I could try. Uh, I think before we go any further, we must thank our lovely Patreon subscribers. Well, we must indeed. So thank you so much to uh, Jessica Meisner. And Jenny Mullis. Thank you so much, you lovely people. You're very, very sexy. You're wonderful, wonderful Patreon subscribers. Thank you so much. Uh, the rest of you, you want to be like Jessica and Jenny here. yeah? You want to be with the cool kids. You know, be with yeah. the cool kids. You want to be in our cult. <laughs> yes, indeed. It's uh, very, very exclusive. Who someone this week suggested that we should all be called the Bang Bing Blooms. <laughs> I like that a lot. <laughs> I saw that and I thought, yes, yes, I am there for that. So if you want to be in our cool gang, come and check us out on Patreon. Cornelius guys. is our lord and master. Well, Nick. Hello. Are you ready? Prom, no, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it, to drink cocktails and talk about poison. Yes, always, always ready. Oh, we could drink poison and talk about cocktails. That is equally tempting at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> Have more gin. Have, Have more gin. gin. It's probably poison, it's fine. <laughs> it's okay, it's only episode 33. Exactly, nothing exciting happens here. It's a weird age. I keep thinking our podcast is the age, the, the number of episodes. That's it's how I not. See it. We haven't, well, one episode a year for 33 years. <laughs> and that would be a bad podcast. That would be a bad podcast. Or it could be an amazing podcast. It's, it's tempting, actually. So that's that's minimal effort, I feel. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> like people would just gather around once a year to listen to this. <laughs> around the wireless. They'd all put their hats on. The bank <laughs> booms would come over the hill. Absolutely. With torches. <laughs> Well, we're ready. We're going to go with the first one. Yes, we're going to talk about we are. cocktails. Uh, drink point. Oh, fuck. We're going to drink cocktail and talk about poison. Are you sure? Uh, I don't know. This has got very confused. But then again, you may feel that we've gone for the latter because it's my that episode is true. Yes. this week. Not great, a good great, ingredient. Great. Dear listeners, as you know, every week we make a cocktail that includes a secret ingredient that is inspired by the tale that we tell. Uh, my story. So I got to pick it. And the secret ingredient this week is beer. There must have been something better. Beer, beer in this story glorious than beer. beer. See, I can go with anything. I can go with art and Sicily <laughs> and anything else, but beer, really. Okay, when you say you go with art and Sicily and everything, you give me shit for it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'm going to give you shit for beer as well, to be honest. So you're not escaping this week. It's going to be much more bitter. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's beer. There were some other ingredients, but um. And again, listeners, do you, uh, you you can weigh in on this as well. No. We are getting to a stage where there's always something we can find as an ingredient. But there's some stories where there's a recurring ingredient, the one that we've done before. And there are many, many cocktails that are based around that ingredient. So things like coffee and tea and sugar. Well, you had apples things. was the alternative for this one. It was. And we had, we've done apples with Amy Arch Gilligan. Exactly. So we couldn't possibly do it again. Or could we? Well, there we go. How do you feel if we repeat? Or maybe we have to have some sort of variant or a different picture. A different type of apple. <laughs> this is a Granny Smith week. <laughs> there are different kinds of this apple. This is a Pink Lady week. <laughs> This is a... I don't know any other... This apple. is a Bramley week. Bramley, I knew you were going to say Bramley. All right, name a fourth apple. Cox's apples. Shit. Jazz. Jazz. Jazz apples. Well, it's not fucking apples. Or Granny right. Smith, they're apples. <laughs> you just said it. Did I say Granny Smith? Smith? Yes, I don't know. <laughs> you see, you know five apples and that's it. Well, that's I know them very sense. well. They're my friends. <laughs> It's not apples. Uncle Bert, he's an excellent it's, apple. It's beer. Uh, boo. You're going to have to get on board with this. Boo. So, As you might have guessed, I'm not a fan of a beer. You are not a beer <laughs> drinker. Nick will drink nearly anything, but uh, beer is not his thing. Well, you don't look appalled. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all right. 
I'm fine. I just don't like shouting about it, Nick, or doing anything. I just don't like advertising the fact that I'm an alcoholic. So yes, probably should have thought of that before we started this podcast. <laughs> Potentially, built around yes. Cocktails. <laughs> Built around true crime and poisoning. The cocktails are a mere side attraction. The thing that got you involved in the first place. (laughs) Indeed. No, it's all about the true crime. The cocktails just give it that extra. Mm. Exactly. But with beer, okay, so because beer this week and beer is not Nick's favourite thing in the world, I am choosing the cocktail. Yes, indeed. Mm. I've put my life in your hands. Yeah, let's talk about that golden Cadillac. (laughs) I did not make that purposely disgusting. Yeah, let's talk about all the chartreuse. Yeah, okay, I made them purposely (laughs) marvellous, and you're just wrong. (laughs) I have, with with bearing all of that in mind, with the milk and orange juice and the various chartreuse debacles that have happened, I have really tried this week to to find a cocktail that you will like. Well, I appreciate it. Now, I love beer. Now, I have on this occasion gone, as soon as I saw it was beer, I was like, craft beer, my sort of thing, nice. I'm a pale ale drinker. She's not. She drinks Foster's. I do. I drink Foster's. Well, one those have run out and the shop says, no more for you. (laughs) You have to go onto the craft craft ale. (laughs) go up the the shelf level of basically going up in price. I love a craft ale and I'm sure many of our listeners will be with us on that. Nice, crisp, flavourful one. But I have chosen very carefully... I've looked around. There were two. There were a couple of options, and I nearly made Nick try a horrible one. But we'll save that for a video. Lucky uh, me. And the cocktail that we are going to go with this week yes. is "Here Comes the Sun." I have not heard of that. Or perhaps it should be called "Beer Comes the Sun." You've been working on that a long time, haven't you? All day. <laughs> Didn't go to work. No. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> Thinking of that pun all day. <laughs> what can I do? There's something that rhymes with here. <laughs> and it has to be beer related. My God, this is impossible. <laughs> Who sung that song? Oh, the Beatles. There's, there's, there's the Beatles. 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 George Harrison song. Here comes the yes. sun. Doot and doot. Great song. Little darling. Let's just sing that for Let's a while. Let's just sing a song. Oh, that's all we're going to do. No, I want a drink. Oh, right. God damn it. Oh. Even if it is beer, beer related. <laughs> okay. Beer, secret ingredient. Here comes the sun. I am now going to go and attempt to make a beer based cocktail that to Nick. Well, I'm quite looking forward to this as someone else is making me a drink. I find that marvellous. So, without any further ado, I'm going to go. I, I, you, you are going to go to the Poisonous Captain Kitchen and shake up a storm. So, we'll see you in a minute. We'll see you in a bit. And we're back. Hello. So, Nick? It smells beery. <laughs> I don't like it. Here comes the sun, Nick. No. Okay, so it's got a lovely beery hue. Mm. <laughs> Are you dubious? Are you susp- you're, look- you're really actually backing away in your seat while you're looking at it. Like, I don't like it. Should I talk you through it? Go on then. Tell me what monstrosity you have created. So, we have bourbon. I like that. We have ginger syrup. I like that too. We have lemon juice. I like that. We have that shaken over some ice. I like that. And then we top it up with a little, no, I don't like this. little bit of craft beer. Now, how, I, how much is a little about, bit? About an ounce. No, that's not very much. So not too much. I put more in mine, to be honest. <laughs> uh, so yeah, you shake up all the ingredients. You pour that out. Lovely, lovely, lovely. And then top up with beer. Now I used, it said you can use a wheat beer, which would be quite nice. I've used, I've actually gone with a mango IPA because right. it's a little bit sweeter. It's not too horrible and bitter and you won't cry. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, in theory. Now I've never made this before, to be fair. But should we, should we try? Let's give it a go. Okay. Let's give it a go. Merry here Christmas. It's actually not unpleasant. <laughs> <laughs> yes! Yes! Damn yes! you! <laughs> <laughs> I thought... I could lie and say it's horrible, but no, that would be dishonest to the alcohol. It's um, actually very nice because the beer is not a overly overpowering yeah. on it. So, it's, yes, it's very pleasant. There you go. Now, the key is, I think, is to make it really, really cold. I purposely chose this one because the quantities were lots of bourbon, lots of nice ginger syrup in there. So the ginger syrup I used was I didn't make my own. I got um, some stem ginger in a, in a jar, siphoned the syrup out of that and actually put some of the stem ginger in there. You can smell the ginger in it. Yes, that's because there's ginger in it. <laughs> yes. Lots of lemon juice, and then topped it up with a lovely fruity IPA. That's, that's actually very pleasant. It is, it is nice, that. No, I'll give you that. It is a good, it is a nice beverage. I would probably not <laughs> say no to another one. Oh, oh my God, oh my God. 
God, let's make more. <laughs> There's loads of beer cocktails. If I was surprised actually this week because I thought people would come through with loads of IPA based ones. Everyone came through with Guinness based and stouts and yes. things, which is great. Where the hell were you in Guinness week? That is actually, I'll give you that one. Well done. Hooray. That is that is a nice that is a nice drink. Here, co- here comes the sun. The here sun comes came, the sun, and the we sun were came. happy to see it. Yeah, we were, and then it went away again. So we've got them firmly in hand. Yes. Yeah, I got a cold beer on a October um, oh, yes, evening. On the... <laughs> Would you like to have a story? Oh, I probably. Great. We are in two continents this week. Ooh. We're going to be in one. We're going to get on another one. Then we're going to come back to the other one. That That is in fact two. We're in the early 1800s. Ooh, that's exciting. Partially late 1700s. Mm, I like this. Tell me good. this week we're going to tell the story of John Towell. I do not know this name. Yes, and it's a man. It's a man. Not a man in ages. We haven't. No, that's very true, actually. We really haven't. Uh, yes, on Patreon, there's been a few chaps. So you're missing out, Peyton. The people are not on Patreon. Yeah. All these chaps. I did look back and just kind of go, woman, 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 woman. Well, probably oh, Crippen. Well, we're Crippen was the last one, yeah, I think. Crippen, um, number 25. Uh, bitches be crazy. That's all we can say. <laughs> <laughs> it is now proved. Finish me first. <laughs> John Tarble. So John... We'll just call him John. Just John. Just, yes, John. just John. Just John. Just John. So John was born in 1784 in Beckles, Norfolk. Ooh, nice. Ooh, yep. Yeah. Don't think we've been to Norfolk yet. Now, see, when you said two continents, I thought, oh, perhaps it's going to be like our Asia and, and the Antarctic or something. <laughs> Some, somewhere, somewhere we haven't been, somewhere new. Famous Antarctic poisoners. Exactly. They, they were in Asia and then they fled to the, <laughs> to the Antarctic. To the Arctic, or whichever one's a continent. It was very cold. This is my GCSE geography is not doing well there. <laughs> That's why there's no poisoners there. They don't know where the fuck they are the whole time. No, he was born in Norfolk. In Norfolk. Not, and he went briefly to Antarctica uh, and then came back. But it's cold. I don't know why. <laughs> why did um, I do that? You know, he may well have done because, surprise, surprise, not much is known about his childhood. <laughs> he did a lot of travelling in pre-teens. Well, we could make it up. I mean, we, no one knows. No one's going to come at us for this. He kept bees. He made bananas. This is all in his childhood. Took loom lessons. He was a very busy young man. He was. And he always wanted to make a waterproof cat. But his childhood dreams were dashed. Now I think you're making stuff up. It, surely not. But we know at the age of around 14, in 1798, he got a job working as a shop boy in London. Fancy London town. Fancy London, yeah. And the shop was owned by a Quaker woman. And she, as religious types often do, persuaded him to come along to their friends' meetings. So Quakers often known as friends. Yeah. Come, 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 join our, you know, very sensibly dressed, <laughs> pious, quite a, all for the abolition of slavery. So we don't... Can't argue with that. that. Indeed, can't come argue Come to our meetings, come to our meetings. So it wasn't long beca- before he became a Quaker himself. And he was very devout to the religion. And he worked in various shops and businesses owned by Quakers across the city. So he was doing quite well for himself. Till around about the age of 22... He met a servant girl. Oh, my. Called Mary. 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 And she was not a Quaker. Hussy, she must have been. (laughs) And he seduced her. My God. There's not enough seduction these days, I think. Is there not? Not really. It's more of a kind of, well, socially distanced meet at a bar. Well, yeah, at the the moment, no. (laughs) Go on Tinder and seduce someone on that. (laughs) (laughs) Well, he seduced her in the, I suppose, the old-fashioned sense, because the Quakers were not at all happy with this. They weren't happy that he was seducing a young girl, and that mainly she wasn't a Quaker. So he was disowned, effectively, by the Quakers. Seems a rather excessive reaction. It it does. And, And John and Mary got married. Might have had something to think to do with the fact that she was pregnant at the wedding. <laughs> yeah. Well done, John. Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> You've had a bit of beer. And oh, no. <laughs> I've turned into a right lad. <laughs> this is this the lad's hour with Nick now? Way going here, my son. <laughs> oh, it's going to get weird. You're just going to be planning a fantasy football team. And <laughs> <laughs> they more beer than that. <laughs> I hope they all win. <laughs> Yeah, that's my fantasy. I hope everyone gets first prize. No, the, uh, John and Mary get married despite him being kicked out of the Quakers, and he's upset about that. And they go on to have two kids. Oh, lovely. As one does when one is married. What to have two kids? I think not it's... one, not three, but two. Two is the number you shall have, yeah, and is, no more. It's generally the average, I feel. But now, a father of two and a husband, he switched professions from shop boy to assisting a druggist. Nice. In cheap side. We Excellent. haven't had a druggist in a while. We haven't, no. Yeah, this is true. It's nice. We've got druggists. We've got men. Good you're, day. You're, 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 you're happy, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he learned the trade quite quickly and he seemed to be having quite a promising career as training up as a chemist. But there was trouble ahead. Uh... But not the kind of trouble you might think. He did get himself into very big trouble because he was caught in 1814 forging Ooh. a £10 note 
from the Uxbridge Bank. So that would have been an awful lot of money. A lot of money. A lot of money. And Ten that's... pounds. Would have bought was... your house by there back then. Not only that, forgery, capital offence. Mm. Serious, serious Absolutely. trouble. When John stood trial, he was indeed found guilty of forgery, sentenced to death. Yep. Yep. Well, most a lot, a lot of stuff did have the death sentence back then. Like what? What is that? You stole three loaves of bread and you get your head chopped off. <laughs> they weren't decapitating people in the 80s. Or hanging them then. Hanging them while oh. their heads came off. <laughs> yeah, exactly. As a result. <laughs> I think I think the death penalty was rather yeah. more prevalent. It was than... <laughs> it was doled out quite yes, a lot. Yes, exactly. I'm telling you, the earth goes round the sun. <laughs> Hang him. Yeah. No, he's facing the death penalty right now for forging a ten pound note. Very, very bad. Very bad. Bad, 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 John. But lucky for him, the bank that was the victim of his forgery was a Quaker establishment. Um, Now, whether this was a little bit of nasty revenge or bitterness on John's part that he'd chosen this bank, we don't know. But what happened was the Quakers are opposed to the death penalty. mm. They can't be seen to be condoning the death penalty, regardless of who it is, and particularly as he's an ex-Quaker himself. This is not going to look good. So they get his sentence commuted to 14 years transportation to the colonies. Yeah. See, I think I know the death would be preferable, really. <laughs> You've got something against Australia. No, at, at, at that time. <laughs> well, yeah. Well, it's, it's a it's, lot. It's a, it's a, it's, yeah, it's not a fun life. No, yeah, he's married and he's got two kids, but 14 years off you go to the colonies mm. and you will work and you will work and you will work. But he takes it. Off he would go to Sydney. Australia. Shout out to Australian listeners. For several years, when John was out there, he worked on the coal ships around the coast. Not pleasant. Not but fun. because he was a pretty smart religious guy, you know, he was well behaved, he was noticed for being smarter than your average convict. So he was offered opportunities for promotion. He also knew about medicine, what, mm. what they thought would be medical training because he'd worked in a chemist. That was more than a lot of the convicts had had. True. So he was brought in to work in the convict hospital. Eventually his work gets noticed. He becomes a clerk at a local school or academy, I think it is. And people are impressed by his intelligence and his faith. And eventually John receives a pardon. Nice. He's Good done for John. his time. Well done. He gets his ticket of leave from the governor in 1820. So he's been out there for six years. Six years of After six work. years, yeah. So skip. Yeah, sentence for 14. Yeah. And he's obviously done a damn good job to get released after six. Yes. So good when for you, John. Good, good for John. And when you're released and you're free, you're free to set up your own business. You can do what you like. And he stays in Australia. He decides to set up his own druggist store in Sydney. Lovely. He has no formal training or qualifications, but a local medical board give him an accreditation. And because he's got an accreditation, business is booming. John does incredibly well. His store is able to expand. He gets bigger premises. He's able to invest in property and various business ventures. Importing, all it says is fancy goods. From <laughs> <laughs> nice. I do enjoy a fancy good. <laughs> well, even better, he exports to London whalebone. Nice. For corsets. All those corsets. All those corsets and toothbrushes and combs. Nice. But mainly for corsets. Mainly for corsets. He wore them himself. He modelled them. (laughs) And he'd not forgotten his dear family. His wife and children move to Sydney in 1823. So they've been without him for a long time. Mm. But they they come on over. They go on over. And he insinuates himself. He starts trying to join the Quaker community in Australia. He's an active and passionate member. Complete with the wide-brimmed hat. He wears all of the outfit. The long coat. The big, big, big hat. Big hat. Bigger than anyone else's. He can do nothing wrong. He also was said, this is where you may start to not have sympathy for John and I need to brace you for this because it's not nice Mm. he made public displays of his temperance by pouring casks of gin and rum into the sea at Sydney Cove yeah see bastard general utter bastard that's all we can say about him he has lost all respect all sympathy (laughs) transportation was too good in my book (laughs) despite all of his piety Despite all of these displays of taking people's booze and throwing it into the sea. People who are allowed to drink, but would not even Quakers give it back. He is still not accepted by the Quaker community in Australia. The guy can't win with the Quakers. Mm. He's not accepted in England. And they're not going to accept him in Australia because he's a convict. Because he's got a criminal past. They it's all, of... all about forgiveness and mm. being... But yes. piety... It is meant to be forgiveness and friendship and... And kindness, but he, he's been a convict. But forgiveness has its limits. <laughs> come on. <laughs> and they also know about the girl back in, you know, he's got a bit of a lust on him, maybe. A woman was pregnant out of wedlock. 
even though he married her. But you can imagine he's bitter, you know, he doesn't mm. say, what can I do to please these people? To be friends with the friends. <laughs> so maybe it's for this reason he starts to yearn to go back to London. Maybe it's not the receptive welcome that he's getting from the Quakers in Australia. Maybe he feels like, oh, okay, if I go back to London, I'll be quizzing. There is no place like London. No place like home. It's probably not a wise decision to go back. Having enjoyed the fresh, clean climate of Sydney, the fresh air, the family, as soon as they get back to London, smog. Oh, that log London industry. smog and coal everywhere coal everywhere all the coal smoke everywhere coal yeah. fires and coal smoke going on <laughs> you step horses off. everywhere <laughs> you step off the the boat and they go here's your piece of coal yeah here's yeah, a horse the to keys. fart at you <laughs> <laughs> you run out of coal burn the horse <laughs> <laughs> yeah when they get back into that climate the whole of the family are struck by bouts of ill health when they settle back into london it, they just get ill and it's not a clean place while we kind of think that every single death associated with a poison story has got to be the poisoner behind the scenes killing people sudden and young deaths weren't uncommon and that's what happened sadly to john's family tragedy hit the family but their youngest son william died in 1833 and five years later in 1838 the eldest son who was on his way to becoming a doctor also dies probably both from tb mary the mother always been sickly she is struck down by tb as well and also the loss of her two sons is just knocked her for six and john hires a nurse for her sarah lawrence she would later change her name to sarah hart for no reason okay and her efforts to care for mary did not prove fruitful she's a shit nurse uh, because <laughs> with the best will in the world mary died Later right. in 1838. I, I, I feel some comforting going on. I think... In, you know, in, well, in, in the future, do? there might be some comforting. The heartbroken husband. Heartbroken. Nothing to suggest that these deaths were suspicious, but he's very sad. And he's very he sad. And he finds comfort in yep. Sarah's bosom. See? Always the comfort that gets you. Always the nursey comfort. Always have sex with a nurse. That's the moral of the story. <laughs> Don't. <laughs> John was very taken with Sarah. No. They continue to have an affair for several years they carry on they even have two children together now i know what you're thinking why not just marry her there is that yeah sarah's just not really marriage material <laughs> i mean john what's a respectable wife right okay i mean i don't know if there's no reports to suggest that sarah is just some sort of bog dwelling idiot <laughs> <laughs> who was crawled into the house claiming to be a nurse. I mean, she, she was hired and there would be nothing wrong with her being married. <laughs> that seems a tad harsh. <laughs> well, I'm saying, that's what I'm saying, she's not. <laughs> Sarah, the bog-dwelling idiot nurse. <laughs> well, Mary died. Come on. She couldn't have been that good a nurse. <laughs> No, there's nothing to suggest that she... Let's picture her as that for the rest of the yes. story. Actually. Hunchbacked. <laughs> covered in seaweed, probably. <laughs> the children were otters. <laughs> so there she is. He's like, by God, I can't marry this woman. <laughs> to be fair, you know, he, he has to keep her out of the way in London. He sets her up in a cottage in Slough. Which is a cruel, cruel fate. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Salt Hill near Slough. Her and the children. And they go into the cottage. He is to keep her away from the public. While the affair was going on, John had once again tried to insinuate himself into the London Society of Friends, the Quakers. Doing endless charity work and donating to Quaker causes in the UK and in Australia, where he still had his business ventures. But the Quakers don't want him. They tolerate him being around, but they're not going to give him full membership because of his seemingly salacious past. But John did meet a very charming Quaker widow, a Miss Cutforth. Nice. Mrs. Cutforth. I like that. She sounds like an evil nanny. Either evil that governor, or governor. I feel perhaps her husband was a pirate. <laughs> Captain Cutforth. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, okay. I think that's a good pirate name. <laughs> that's a brilliant pirate name. She became a Quaker after he died. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> to atone for his sins. <laughs> Of this evil pirate husband. And he was drawn to her somehow with a cutlass ah, shining between her teeth. Exactly. But covered in tattoos. <laughs> <laughs> he meets Widow Cutforth <laughs> and she's much more the ticket. And even though friends and family of Widow Cutforth are going, no, don't marry John. He's not a sailor. <laughs> the couple were married in 1841. So he's married, another Quaker woman, Sarah. She shacked up in this cottage near Slough but he's paying what's wrong with Slough come friendly bonds come fall on Slough <laughs> no Slough's lovely it's lovely Salt Hill sounds like a lovely place it might have been lovely at the time it's, it's... where the bog witch lives <laughs> <laughs> it's 
haunted forevermore. <laughs> no, he still goes to her. She can't be that crazy because he managed to get there <laughs> once a week. And he pays her one pound a week maintenance. Right. Which is still a lot of money. Maintenance. Then. Maintenance. Well, yeah, but he has to for the oh, children. Has children, yes, okay. I suppose. He has, yes. he has born two children. Responsibilities. He has born two children. She has born him two children. Right. He bore two children. Fathered? <laughs> yeah, that. Fathered two children by the bog witch <laughs> in the ritual in the cave. <laughs> so he has to pay her one pound a week, otherwise she'll go to the authorities or bring a curse upon his head. And this arrangement works for a couple of years. Sarah off in her cottage, cut forth. In, out out in, at sea. In, out at sea. <laughs> but this, this can't last forever. It's a shaky premise at best, I fear. John was running into financial trouble. All his business ventures, they're just not working out. Businesses in Australia were not faring well he's losing money he has two families to maintain mm. as well I mean I don't, I don't think he has any other children with Mrs Cutforth certainly he's having to pay maintenance at a pound a week is not no some, it's a substantial sum exactly yes. substantial sum it's not just some horrible kind of really cruel no. token he is a quid love what to do what to do what to do about this predicament I know someone has to go and who do we think it will be might it be Sarah? New Year's Day, 1845. John visits a druggist and purchases two bottles of Shields Prussic Acid. Ooh. Da, da, da. A treatment used for varicose veins containing hydrogen cyanide. That'll do it. Prussic acid as well. Mm. Haven't had that in a long time. No, indeed. Haven't had that at all. I don't think we've actually had it named as that. No. No. First all around here. Yes, indeed. He buys this. Off he goes to Sarah's. Now, maybe it's innocent. Maybe he has varicose veins and he's shy. Maybe she has varicose veins. I think we've established the fact that she's a bog witch. She's got a lot more wrong with her than varicose veins. Bit mean, just unsubtle about the legs. Clean yourself up, love. But he turns up either way at the house. And the couple settle down for the evening and they enjoy a lovely bottle of beer! <laughs> Yay! Actually says beer. Yay! Unfortunately, on But was it mango beer? <laughs> mango beer stirred in with a few ginger things. This is a lovely fruity IPA that I bought you from the local place. All right, full disclosure. In some of the other reports that I read later after that first one and then went, beer, that's it, I've decided. Some of them were like, yes, it was stout. Oh, shit. <laughs> stout I sent it in for a delightful a bottle of Merlot. <laughs> <laughs> it's fruity either way it was a fruity beer <laughs> whatever they wanted to call it you could brought a water it's beer shut up woman they share their lovely beer toasting in the new year for it is new year's day not long after the drinks were shared a neighbour the next door neighbour hears through the party walls awful groans and moans it's not that That's, that could just be celebrating the new year potentially <laughs> by moaning oh no not shagging no. <laughs> no I thought you meant like we were celebrating the new year oh shit <laughs> oh Thank I was God. thinking of something slightly more joyful <laughs> <laughs> From, well if it's 2020 most people are like oh not another one why will it not end <laughs> they, nor were they nor were they enjoying themselves groans. no these are enough to raise <laughs> concerns from the neighbour the neighbour goes to see if Sarah is alright as she's Coming out, she sees a man in distinctive Quaker dark clothing leaving the house. Notes this and goes in. The neighbour finds Sarah writhing on the floor. Two glasses sitting on the side and a beer bottle between them. Sarah is frothing at the mouth and screaming in agony. The local reverend, the authorities of the area are called in, but Sarah is dead before the doctor can arrive. Now, this isn't a case of people looking down and going... Oh, cholera. Fine, let's go to the pub. You know, <laughs> oh, she probably died of, I don't know, witches. Clearly it's foul play. They know that something has gone wrong and they've seen a man leave the house. And even though John has been a regular to the house, this is still enough to cause suspicion. Here's where things change. Mm -hmm. The authorities in Salt Hill, some say it was the police, some say it was the local reverend um, of the, and the town clerk. He would be very active in the community. Gather what's happened. Knew a suspect has been seen leaving the premises and, they, and has gone to the station. They race to the station themselves. They arrive just in time to see a man matching the neighbour's description board the train to Paddington Station. But damn it all, they can't catch the train, they can't stop it, they see him on the train. So what do they do? What do they do? They use their wiles to think, hmm, we do have a very, very curious piece of technology. 
in Slough <laughs> that might help us. They have a telegraph. For they it. have a telegraph. How exciting. Yes, very, very new. Not oh, quite. The Reverend goes to the station master and they say, we have to send a telegraph to Paddington. And they transmit this message to Paddington. A murder has just been committed at Salt Hill. And the suspected murderer was seen to take a first-class ticket to London by train that left Slough at 7.42pm. He is in the garb of a Quaker with a brown great coat on which reaches his feet. He is in the last compartment of the second first-class carriage. Curious thing as well about this message. That's a lot to telegraph. <laughs> yeah, the guy's frantic. Yeah, I've that's, never that's, done this before. <laughs> that's, that's a lot of tapping. It is. And also, curious thing, Quaker came through spelled K-W-A-K-E-R. <laughs> because there's no Q. Is there not? Apparently there's no Q. It's a two-needle instrument. I don't know How why. Any- also, it meant at the other end that people, and again, at both ends, they had to say Quaker so many times <laughs> because people didn't understand. What's a quacker? What's a quacker? Quaker! Quake! A Q... You what? Could just what phonetically? They'll get it. They'll get it. <laughs> Apparently, this caused really like was like minutes down to it of people trying to work out what it was. But this message is sent. Great Western Railway Police are alerted to the message. Enter Sergeant Williams. Sergeant Williams arrives at the scene, puts a coat over his uniform so he won't be seen. That's the height of disguise. Exactly. I put on a coat. <laughs> he had his helmet on the entire time. <laughs> he follows, he watches out for the suspect. The suspect leaves the train. The officer follows him and they both board the omnibus. Nice. nice. You like an omnibus. When did we last see an omnibus? Uh, we saw it with George Bodel. George and, Bodel um, and, the, and the amazing P- police and PC officer. Morris. And PC Morris. PC Morris. PC Morris is still on that bus. <laughs> <laughs> He's still doing the tour of the pubs in the local area so. <laughs> he now drives the omnibus he's just like and here on the left is a pub come on everyone <laughs> yes and um, we're gonna stop here for three hours <laughs> <laughs> on to the omnibus they go sergeant williams sits in the conductor seat trying to look inconspicuous the bus stops at princess street john goes to get off he actually hands a sergeant 6d for his fare ah nice he thinks he's, he the, thinks conductor. he's the conductor <laughs> have six okay. pence. bloody umquids in here this is <laughs> williams then has to get off the bus somehow without john seeing him either hurling himself off when the bus is still going and running frantically back the corner and then he just proceeds to follow him around for the evening i think it must be because back at the head office they're building the case or they're just checking the evidence against this guy i don't know but for some reason they just follow him around they see him probably have to get some sort of more information from these crazy people in slough who have sent this message and people are going well who has sent this message oh it was two kids oh fine let's arrest him anyway (laughs) so they've probably got to perhaps for some verification sort of thing the first time they've got a telegraph machine two kids have already broken in and sent boobs down the line (laughs) alright it's the sweary kids again god damn it why did we get this telegraph (laughs) it's either the kids sending that or the station master just going (laughs) kids John goes into the Jerusalem coffee house. They follow him to his lodgings in Scott's yard, goes to sleep, waits for the backup to come. Next morning, he goes back to the coffee shop and that's where they make the arrest. John was protested at the arrest and saying, I wasn't in Slough yesterday. But Sergeant Williams replied, yes, you were, sir. You got off the train and got onto the omnibus and you gave me sixpence. <laughs> nice. <laughs> John haughtily retorted, my station in society would be to sufficient to rebuke any suspicion against me. What? Mm. Diva. Mm. It's not enough, apparently. No, No, John is sent to jail. He's going to stand trial. He sends for the best lawyer that money could buy and enter Sir Fitzroy Kelly. Nice. In hindsight, best money that lawyer could buy may not have been the best idea. (laughs) The trial opened on the 12th of March, 1845. The court hears the evidence. A post-mortem has revealed that Sarah Lawrence, later Hart, has been poisoned by prussic acid. The witnesses take the stand. The neighbour describes the scene. Sergeant Williams describes following John through the streets. Everyone stands up and mounts up evidence after evidence of, yes, it all points to John. Sir Fitzroy Kelly stands, smug, confident. (laughs) He proclaims in his defence but two words. Apple pips! Right. His defence was built entirely on the fact that prussic acid naturally occurs in apple pips. Right. And okay. That Sarah must have eaten a whole bunch of apples over the past few weeks, and that cumulatively led to her death. He's a terrible lawyer. <laughs> but he's a sort of lawyer because he's a sir. 
<laughs> he could probably thinks he can do anything yeah. he puts his mind to. I, I, and he probably got the job really easily. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He, was, he was quite of high station, but he yeah. genuinely, you can imagine, he stands up and thinking, this is foolproof. I'm, Absolutely, yeah. I, my God, I'm going to be remembered. My I'm God, gonna I'm going to be good. remembered for this. And there was a, a thing we've discussed before with experts of how many apples I mean, it would take. it is hundreds of apples. It's millions. <laughs> it's, it's, it's insane. But interesting, the jury really thinks about this. Do they? For 30 minutes. <laughs> they find John guilty of murder. He tries to add to his defence that Sarah tried to kill herself. No one's listening to Man. it. It is too late. 100% they find him guilty. And John is sentenced to death for the second time mm. in his life. But this time, there would be no Quakers no, to save him. But what about Fitzroy? Did he not leap to the rescue? Yeah, he's done his... He he's had his apple pip. He literally had two words written down. He ran away. He just stood up and apple pips, I rest my case. That's all I've got. <laughs> but do you want to explain any of the signs behind it? No, nope. I, I didn't think that far ahead. Here's I my thought... fee. <laughs> Apparently, while awaiting execution, John made a full confession to Ooh. a priest that was handed to a jailer. This confession has never been found, never been kept, no one's ever seen records of it, so they don't know if it's hearsay or whatever. But he was hanged by the neck until he was dead on the 28th of March, 1845, Brilliant. watched by 15,000 people. Two interesting things that follow this case. Are they interesting? They are. They better be. One's one's better than the other. <laughs> <laughs> one's less interesting than the other. One's more facty. It should be, and we should all be paying attention. Because right. the Telegraph was a real winner in this case. This was the first person to be arrested as a result of Telegraph communications. Before Crippen, for all of this, it was the mm. first one where they used Telegraph. Get get him. Get, get him. him. He's moving. People knew the Telegraph was supposed to be useful, but this was one of the cases where people went, damn, that's that, some that good. That is useful. That's some good technology. <laughs> First demonstration of its remarkable speed because it was a really big case. And that Telegraph transmitter is preserved in the Science Museum. Oh, how London. nice. Yeah, nice. Do you want to hear the second fact? Go on then. Sir Fitzroy Kelly. I like Fitzroy Kelly. Best lawyer the money could buy? Absolutely. Was forever known as Apple Pip Kelly. <laughs> nice. After this, for the rest of his life, Apple Pip Kelly because of that defence. While he was ridiculed for it, yeah, maybe some people thought, oh, okay, fair enough, you, you gave it your best shot. Apple sales dropped dramatically uh, after this trial because people were genuinely People were frightened. terrified of eating apples. And we've all heard it. We've all heard the stories. Mm. Ah, they've got cyanide in your stomach. So that was the legacy <laughs> of John Cal. Nice. Ta-da! That's a good story. I like that. I did not hear that story. The story. Game of story. But the Telegraph, we did, we did cross two continents. We did. Not the ones I was hoping for, but we're fine. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> we went to England, we went to Australia, there were apple pips. What more do you there want? There was a big brimmed hat. They put everything there in There was this. a bog witch. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Sarah's kids were taken into care as well. That's, uh, that's the less... I didn't yeah, why, that well, why did you just add that in at the end and make everyone miserable? Well, you could, we were calling her bog witch. I thought, like, oh, by the way, <laughs> she didn't fare well out of this. <laughs> you call she her went, a bog lady. She went back to the bog. She haunts, she, haunts she, haunts the, she haunts the slough bog. The bog's the slough. The children went, no, we're fine, mother. We'll go <laughs> <Yes>. to care. <laughs> Please stop putting seaweed on our face. <laughs> so there you go. John, I can't say his surname. Tarwall. Tarwall. How do you say, like, Tarwall, like say. a narwhal? T-A-W-E-L-L. Yeah. Tarwall. Yeah. Tarwall. That's what I thought. Towel? I, I want to say mm. towel, but it sounds like towel. You can say whatever you like. I can, actually. The fucker's dead. <laughs> <laughs> no one's going to come after you. So there we go. Thoughts on the case? Um, apples. Yes, apples. <laughs> apples. I'm still, I'm loving Fitzroy Kelly. I think it's just a brilliant name. Sir Fitzroy, Sir Ke Fitzroy Kelly. Fitzroy Kelly. He did have some interesting titles that weren't that interesting. He was the chairman of the, the, the seat of the something. It was something of the seat like of the something. that. Maybe actually I'm remembering it wrong and he was Lord Chancellor of the Exchequer. I don't know, but... Because Fitzroy is quite a fancy name. It is. So he must have had some sort of fanciness. Well, he was a sir and he yes. was a lawyer. Because Fitzroy, son of the king, so... I don't think I can't imagine he was, but... Apple Pip Kelly. Like. Apple Pip Kelly. That's, that's a better name. Yeah, Apple Pip Kelly. I it's like a that. shit defence. <laughs> I mean, it really is. When you put more of it in than that... Yes. Um, try, try and have another defence. I mean, even as I think it was said that John himself was trying to put across a defence of like, maybe she killed herself. Kelly was like, no, no, sit down, John. It's apple pips all the way. All the way. That's the foolproof is this <laughs> apple, apple pip defence. I've yeah. used it hundreds of times. It's always worked before. Indeed. <laughs> it seemed to me that, that he was so desperate to be accepted by the Quakers. It does seem strange that he was so desperate. 
for that. Obviously, a relatively successful man mm. in in business and things. He didn't need their charity or their connections or anything no. like that. He did seem he to He really do. wanted to be but, seen. But why he was that, yeah, that desperate for their acceptance is a... Is a strange. It's strange. It's supposed to be a strange thing, but then, mm. then we say religion at that time was of a much more of an importance to many people than it is perhaps now. There which, we yeah, are. that is most peculiar. Definitely. Though I do want to hear more about Captain Cutworth. <laughs> his, his his voyages on the sea. Absolutely, and his pirate wife. <laughs> his so. pirate wife, who had a shit end actually, <laughs> so. married a murderer. But then she was free to, to. She was. She was free to, to, to go back to, to life go on the sea. to go back to life on the sea to roam oh, the oceans. She inherited. So she was actually probably the better off out of all of it because she was like going back and forth from Australia to England <laughs> in her big pirate ship. She was having. <laughs> she, she was having a great. That as well. Yeah, she was having a great time. So like, she inherited that from her husband, yeah, from, from Captain her Cutworth, husband, from Captain Cutworth, and it had just been like in storage or like in a dock somewhere in a dry dock in a dry dock having some work done <laughs> we should write the stories of captain i know Cutworth. maybe captain. he poisoned people and she helped poison people uh, <gasps> oh my god well if you want to hear more of the stories <laughs> of captain cutworth and his um, pirate wife and his pirate and his pirate <laughs> wife into october because we're now officially in the spooky month Yay! we are <laughs> so it's anything goes i think in october we'll do any old story that you want <laughs> Will we? Okay. Yeah, we will. We'll tell you all the kind of tales that you want to hear. What do you think about John and his poisony ways and about Quakers? If there are any Quakers listening, God, God love you. I know some Quakers. They're very nice people. Oh. But back then, cruel. Well, not cruel. <laughs> I think they were fine, to be honest. John was the bastard. Well, yeah. Let's yes. let's go with the murderer was the more the problem. Yes, yes. The, out the, of all the of hydrogen them. cyanide <laughs> with his with his bog witch wife. Uh, maybe I'm the bastard in this one. <laughs> Bog, which is the greatest poison of them all. <laughs> what do you think of John and the story? Send us your thoughts, send us your comments, send us your musings, and send us your short stories about Captain Cutworth and his. Yeah, indeed, wife. yes. We, we, we must make up an entire life story. It make a good, it's a good song title as well, I feel. Oh, you want me to write a song? I want you to write a song. Okay. Called Captain Cutworth and His Pirate Wife. Captain Cutworth and His Pirate Wife. Yeah, 5-7. I'll do it now. <laughs> yeah, that, sounds, that sounds great. I don't know. <laughs> so just, yeah, just make sure you do it. Oh, God. Oh, good God. <laughs> now so you, many. You said it now. You said it now. You have to do it. I will do it. I will. By the end of October, I shall. We'll have, we'll have, have a, a series song. of songs of pirates and ghosts and poisonous. Uh, <laughs> so, so Nick, I think, enjoyed the beer cocktail. I Yes. I was Yay! impressed with that. I must admit, it was surprisingly nice. A little bit, a little tiny drop of beer gives it a little bit of a bit of flavour, a bit of cool hoppiness. Yep. No, hooray, I like hooray, that. Hooray, no, hooray. That was good. I, I would not object to having that again. Well, that will be up on social media later today. I've also got some other beery uh, cocktails that I was going to do for this show. There were so many. One of which does involve one of my favourite drinks and one of Nick's very dubious please keep away from me drinks. I have got some Clamato juice. See, Clamato and beer. That sounds dreadful. That I looked up. A few of you guys have gotten in touch and said, yes, all the way Caesars instead of Bloody Mary's, Clamato juice instead of uh, tomato juice. I love it. I've got a bottle of it. But apparently, yeah, Clamato juice with all the hot sauce and, and Worcester sauce with some beer topped up in it. So I'm going to try it. You, you yeah, absolutely. You I go for it. I will share it on the social media and tell you whether it's worth it or not. If you've tried it, tell us about it. Or the other uses for Clamato juice that we can make Nick try. Yeah. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> but we will put up the here comes the sun on social mm. tonight send us more story ideas please leave us a review on apple itunes tell your friends share the podcast we are nearly at a thousand followers actually on instagram we've got a little way to go but let, let's try and <laughs> nearly it. a little way to go nearly only about a hundred or so <laughs> no it's marvelous maybe, maybe it's 200 i yeah. don't know i don't look at such things because it always helps us always and we have things. to be famous we have to be famous god <laughs> damn it i want to do this for a living nick's okay with it but it's <laughs> I want to sit at home and drink Clamato juice in my palace of podcasts. <laughs> and if you haven't joined us on Patreon, do come and have a look. Come and see all the crazy things we get up to. There are some good episodes on there, which yeah. we hope you will enjoy. So yeah, it's $5 a month, so it's not a crazy amount of money. Come and join us. And if you don't like it, you can go. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> don't like it, leave. It's, it's fine. fine. And then come back, because once you go, you'll know you'll want to come back. Exactly, yes. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening, guys. We have been the people inside the Poisoner's Cabinet. We will see you next week. And remember, your loved ones are trying to kill you. Bye.